<laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, now is uh, the time for everyone in the audience to ask questions. And if you're anything like me, you probably uh, understood a lot of that, but uh, more of it was trying to understand and not necessarily getting everything. Um, I spotted a hand shooting up straight away, so um, there are some roving mics coming around. Um, if you do get a microphone and are going to ask a question, please can you just tell us who you are, um, just for everyone who's listening in at home as well, um, and then we can try and get your question answered. Hi, my name is Chris. Um, I've read some research to say that we'd be in a much better situation now if 7,000 years ago the normal Ice Age um, uh, periods was allowed to happen, but it didn't happen because humans had um, domesticated animals and set up fields of crops, which stopped that Ice Age period happening, and we've been going up ever since then. So have we been affecting the climate since first uh, agricultural 7,000 years ago? Who wants to take that one? Do you want one? I can have a go at starting that. That would be very, very difficult. And I, I think what people get confused about when they talk about ice ages and things like anthropogenic change is really the time scale. Um, when we talk about climate change due to um, orbital effects, so orbital effects is the, the, the way the, work, the Earth wobbles around the sun in terms of its, its axis of uh, rotation and its distance to the sun. Those changes tend to take between 20,000 to 100,000 years to get an equivalent change to what we're seeing uh, due to greenhouse gases. So it's about 100 times slower. So um, the idea... It was happening 7,000 years ago and it didn't happen. Yeah, th but, but due to those timescales, trying to determine that you have actually influenced that cycle um, with any precision, um, I would say it's, it's more than difficult, it's practically impossible to do and that that is quite speculative research in that, in that context. Um, in terms of those large changes to the climate system, they're mostly um, forced by what we call a ice albedo feedback in the Northern Hemisphere and to influence that in terms of attenuating um, the, what we call the Milankovitch cycles, which is in these, these big changes in, in, um, due to the ice ages, I would find that very difficult to believe credibility-wise. What would you say to that? But I'm not saying it's impossible, but... Um um, well, on the second part of the question about whether humans may have influenced climate prior to the Industrial Revolution, I think locally it's certainly true because, you know, through, for example, in Australia, through fire, widespread fire, so I think we've changed, and, and in Europe and North America, I think we've changed the landscape dramatically from certain periods, and I think that would at least have a, a local effect, um, and maybe some of those effects went beyond just the local region. So, you know, I, th I think it's a really interesting area of research that um, should, should continue. Yeah, certainly understanding land use changes, and, and including in uh, pr previous to the 20th century, is, is a very interesting area. Yeah, I, th I think Carl's point about um, about the the orbital changes operating over long, large time periods is uh, as the main trigger as the trigger for our going into an end of ice ages is very important. Um, there's there has been there's some work that's been um, been basically arguing that uh, well we were due to going back into an ice age through those orbital influences maybe in about three to five thousand years, but we've we've possibly put that off by our human influence on the climate. With it, they actually uh, put that off by 30,000 years, I think the figure was. So, um, yeah, so you know, we, we are having substantial impacts on, on our, our climate system just over a fairly, quite a short time period, as, as Carl mentioned. Yeah, so I don't, I don't want to labour this point, but yeah, t for, the, for the Ice Age cycle to work, you need a low carbon um, atmosphere. And mm. actually, once you go above a particular threshold, you tend to turn that mechaniz mechanism off, and that's certainly what you see through the paleo record. Mm. Thank you. Um, just point out that um, do keep your hands up because uh, there'll be quite a few people asking for questions. Um, we've got one at the front here and then a gentleman at the back up there. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> James Ward from University of South Australia. Um, thank you to all the speakers. They were really interesting talks. I've got a question for Scott, I think, mostly, uh, looking at future scenarios, in particular emission scenarios. And you showed a graph that considered the low, medium, uh, and high emission scenarios for temperature rise. Um, now there's a growing body of 
literature emerging that looks at concepts called peak oil and peak gas and peak coal. And so we're talking about the production of fossil fuels reaching a peak and declining in the near future. Um, I've recently published a paper which reviews this literature and finds that these estimates of future fossil fuels are much lower than was previously uh, estimated by the IPCC and, converse, uh, and uh, consequently the B1 or the low emission scenario seems to be the most likely, un, uh, unlike the, the high emission scenarios which are generally considered to be uh, the most likely due to recent tracking. So I just wonder if you have a comment on, on that, Scott. Okay, so just to summarise, I think um, what we're saying is fossil fuels might run out to the point that we won't get to the extremes that are being predicted. Yeah, um, I think there's, uh, I'm not an expert on um, what's going to happen to the emissions. We're climate scientists, so we rely on other experts in the field to provide that information for us, which we then feed into our climate models. But um, I think there is, uncertainty about, there's much uncertainty about what the emissions are actually going to be and I think one major um, factor is what the global community actually decides through policy as to what, we're, what will happen to our emissions. So I agree with you that towards the end of the 21st century there are very large uncertainties in what the emissions will actually be but um, the IPCC is going to produce a new report in the next couple of years and lots of clever people, perhaps you're one of them, has been involved in the process of coming up with new scenarios for the future. And my understanding is that um, the, the, the bulk of the opinion is that they're not too dissimilar to what we used last time around, but there are some differences. But I take your point that there are uncertainties, but um, getting back to what Carl said, I think we can't rule out any of the scenarios that I presented at this stage. So I agree that you know, we could consider lower scenarios, but then someone else may plausibly come up with a, a higher scenario. So yeah, you mentioned low, medium and high, but I think you know, it, it's not necessarily as high as we can go. Yeah, okay. Uh, yep. Just quickly for that, yeah. So, so the idea is not only will we run out, but it'll become less economic to exploit these, which will re actually reduce the use. There's certainly a physical argument there and an economic argument there. It's very hard to zero in on what that will be. The salient point from the science is that we've got more than enough fossil fuel reserves to take us up to about 500 parts per million CO2. And once you do that, you basically put the Earth um, into a position where um, positive feedback effects start to come into play. Mm -hmm. And those p positive feedback effects also include spontaneous release of CO2 from the oceans and from the biosphere itself. So um, if you are counting on us running out of fossil fuels in order <coughs> to avert a uh, dramatic climate change, um, as a climate scientist, that would be a really quite a strange thing to do. And I know that's not what you're saying, but that is an argument that some people are putting forward. That's, yeah. Okay, so we've got a question, gentleman at the back, and then the lady down here. Issue. Testing. My understanding is that people have a good idea of the linear effect of um, greenhouse gases, more, more CO2, increase in temperature, and I, I know um, we, we have mentioned or um, has been mentioned a couple of times about the compounding feedback mechanisms, but I was wondering whether. You might want to elaborate on that some more. I, just with part of the last, last answer, I, I wouldn't have thought it was as high as 500 parts per million that uh, we'd be getting the feedback mechanisms operating. My understanding is that some of them are actually operating now, and um, if, if they work with each other, if work's the right word, then things could accelerate even more quickly, such as uh, what methane releases from the tundra and maybe problems in the um, Amazon basin, the clathrates in the, uh, in, in the uh, continental shelves. I, I gather about a, a dozen of them that, um, that could uh, feed on each other and themselves and make things worse. Yeah, the response of the climate system to increases in greenhouse gas concentrations 
fundamentally relies on feedback processes. So what this means is you increase carbon dioxide, uh, that increases the temperature, but once you increase the temperature, then that can increase the amount of, let's say for example, water vapour in the atmosphere. And so that too is a greenhouse gas. So you get much more bang for your buck. So another way, rather than using feedbacks, you can just call these getting much greater bang for your buck from other things. And I think what Carl was talking about was the feedbacks associated with a greater release of carbon dioxide as time goes on. But you're quite right, there are other, many other feedbacks at work right now, including the water vapour feedback, including the cloud feedback and so on. So I think you're, you're quite right. Yeah, and, and within that context, you know, your, your ice albedo feedback, so how, how quickly something like Greenland, uh, the ice shelf starts to break apart, are things that are very difficult to answer. And I think the atmosphere that the science has been conducted in to actually talk about rapid shifts in climate or sudden shifts in climate has generally been labelled alarmist. So climate scientists have tended to shy away from talking about very dramatic shifts in climate and we've tended to talk about mean changes. So the models will get rapid shifts, but because of the process of the science, we tend to use a whole lot of models and find a mean trajectory and we're, we're very confident about those, so we'll present those. Um, in another alternate reality where the, dis the discussion was perhaps more sensible, we probably would talk about uh, our dramatic shifts in climate more. Okay, so maybe move on to the media a minute. We've got a question from the lady here, then the gentleman from the sound booth, and then the gentleman over there. Mm. Um, I just wondered what the panel members' response would be to those people who say that we shouldn't bother with things like carbon taxes or emissions trading schemes and so on because, hey, we can't make any difference and the rest of the world isn't doing anything and so why don't we just wait till last and let everyone else do something? Okay, so Australia's too small a fish to make a difference. Um, I wonder if people actually know what Australia's relative total greenhouse gas emissions are um, in relation to other countries. We certainly, not per capita in total, emit more than France and Spain and Italy and within the next decade we will probably emit more than Germany whose emissions are coming down. Um, I don't think you'd find many people that would say that Germany is a small fish and doesn't need to do anything on, on the global stage. So in terms of our emissions, everyone's emissions are dwarfed by China's in the U United States. Um, but then when you get to that second tier of industrialised nations, actually we're, we're all within a ballpark uh, figure of, of each other. So um, personally, I mean, I, I'm not a policy person, I'm just a scientist. It doesn't seem to make logical sense to me. But Gentleman at the back. Jo John Patterson, University of Adelaide Retired. Uh, look, I wonder, I think Ray mentioned uh, in passing about Sorry, solar variations, variation of the solar constant. I wonder if, if you could tell us what is the situation as re regarding the variations in the sun's output and is that a consideration in the present discussion? Is that Darren? I don't think I mentioned yeah, that. He wants to jump on that. Yeah, I, um, in our climate models, we can put in individual forces. So I talked a lot about putting in increases in greenhouse gases, but you can actually also put in changes in solar output. And we do find that it is a major factor during the 20th century, that some of the changes that we saw can be attributed to changes in solar output. You can also do the same thing for changes in volcanic activity. So um, what we find is that obviously right near a volcano, things warm up, but actually the, the explosive volcanoes spew out very fine dust into the stratosphere and that actually blocks the sunshine and so it actually leads to a cooling of the planet for a year or two or even longer. And so if you get a succession of these changes, you can actually drive decade to decade and generational changes in the climate system. And lo and behold, when we put these in our climate model, we do find that they, ha they have an impact. But what we do find is that while these things have an influence, a very important influence, they, they don't enable us to capture that accelerated warming that we've actually observed. It's only when we put in the greenhouse gases increase due to human activity that we can recover the accelerated warming. So the, the variations in solar activity explain about a point zero point one of a degree, perhaps, and we've seen about 0.7 or 0.8 of a degree of warming. Yeah, and over the last few decades, the solar forcing is actually going in the wrong direction. If it was just solar forcing, you'd actually expect a, a cooling of the climate system during that period of most rapid warming. To capture all the variability, you need to put all the forcing in there, but to get the warming trend, you need the greenhouse gases in there. Okay, um, so we have a question here, and then the lady at the front. 
Yeah, my, my name is Matt Tomczak, and I want to come back to some shorter time scale. So Darren's opening uh, graph. We had 15 years of drought. The Murray, uh, Murray River didn't reach the ocean, and that was the period when there was a lot of political activity <coughs> and convincing that something had to be done to sort out the Murray River, and that it is basically over allocated to irrigators. Now we have a massive amount of water coming down. The lakes are full. The river is four meters above normal in Blanchetown. What do you say to the irrigators in Queens and New South Wales when they say, well, we're all back to normal. We don't have to do anything. What they, and that's what they are saying at the moment. Well, uh, there's, um, there's, there's quite clearly, uh, there's been, been quite a lot of work just looking at what was driving the, the drought through, uh, through the last 15 years or so across southeastern Australia and the resulting declines in stream flows in the Murray River system that that, um, that, that, that course that, that Carl mentioned, that there's a you know, really strong response in the, um, in, in the hydrological system to that declines in rainfall. And that work through a project called the South e Southeastern Australian Climate Initiative established that most of, that most of that drying across that last 15 years or so could be linked to the human influence on climate change through stronger high pressure systems over south, south over south, southeastern Australia. So, um, and particularly in that autumn period that Carl mentioned. Um, so, you know, there's, there's very likely an underlying drying trend that can be linked back to the human influence on climate um, that, that, um, that was driving that drying over southeastern Australia and, and the Murray River system. Now, that's very likely still there, I and mean, we're likely to see that re emerge um, over the next year or a uh, few years. Uh, pro probably even, possibly even this, this year, um, once this, this very strong La Nina event has finished. Yeah, there's a distinction between drought and a systematic shift in the rainfall. So what we've really been looking at across southern Australia is a, a, about a 15 to 20% reduction in autumn and winter, winter rainfall. That's been exacerbated by repeated drought over the last 10 to 15 years, which is probably natural. Um, but when we look at that, that shift in rainfall in an already arid climate, um, that makes a difference. Um, but the history of Australian water use is one of getting very concerned when it's, when, when it's dry and celebrating when it rains. And there's a fantastic example in South Australia with Goiter's Line that was established to basically keep farming uh, through the southern part of the state through, through some very bad drought years. As soon as it started raining due to the La Nina, the, the farming pushed north again. And um, you know, for many years in the US and Australia, the belief was that the rain followed the plough. So those sorts of beliefs, um, I think, are deeply ingrained in, in people's psyche. And it's difficult to shift attitudes that when it's raining, I, it's very hard to talk about drought when it's raining. Um, it's a bit <laughs> like you know, whoever, whoever scheduled uh, the, the Copenhagen conference in December in the middle of winter was obviously not a very good psychologist. It's, it's, very, it's very difficult to talk about um, the contrary um, position to what people are experiencing. Okay, we've got a question down here at the front and then at the back. Um, Carl and uh, Darren have both just mentioned the subtropical ridge or the, the uh, strength of the high pressure system over the last decade um, associated with the drought. Could you give us some more information about what has caused that uh, increase in strength of the high tropical, um, subtropical ridge? Is it um, human induced or is it natural variability or a combination of both? Yeah, look, the, the determining the, the attribution of the rainfall is a really, really difficult task and we're only just piecing that together now. There is early studies that are suggesting that the intensification of the subtropical ridge, so, so basically a greater mass of atmosphere above southern Australia is consistent with greenhouse gases. And that's in a framework of running models without greenhouse gases, with greenhouse gases, and looking at the correlations of, of what happens to the subtropical ridge. In terms of the mechanistic causality, we're actually still not really clear on the dynamics of what's driving that rainfall change precisely. We've got some idea, and it's probably a half hour uh, uh, presentation to go into that, but Generally, what the models are saying, and this has been a consistent result for the last 20 years from, from the um, coupled models, is that you intensify the hydrological cycle as you put more heat into the atmosphere ocean system. And that means more frequent um, heavy rainfall in the tropics, 
And in the mid-latitudes and Mediterranean climates, it means more prolonged drought interspersed by heavy rainfall. Um, so that's the general result that, 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 that is there. Do you, want, do you want to add to that? No. Thank you. Um, I've got to say, these have all been some very, very um, educated sounding questions. Um, I might actually ask something a little bit more basic, first of all, because um, I'm personally, you know, I, I hear these numbers that are being banded around, and um, you hear the models that um, with human um, forcing, with uh, our effects, there might be a change of, say, one or two degrees to the um, average temperature around the world, and that doesn't actually sound like a very lot to me. So why, why is that so significant? Um, am I dominating here? Someone else to. Um, the global mean temperature is a little bit like your body's core temperature. Um, so if you were to measure someone's core temperature to determine if they had a fever, you probably wouldn't hook up an instrument to their little finger or their earlobe where you'd get wild changes in temperature at any particular time. If you got a three degree increase in your earlobe temperature, you would be, well, what does that mean? If you got a half degree increase in your core temperature uh, or a one degree increase, you'd, you'd know that you're actually pretty sick. And the global mean temperature is a little bit like that. It, it's, 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 a, um, it's a measure that does not change rapidly um, in a way that we have seen over the 20th century by um, associated with greenhouse gases. Why that's important is because it, it really talks to a complete shift of the climate system um, in terms of the extremes and the weather that we experience. And I'll let Scott probably take that up. Well, I was just going to say, one, it's a global average. One degree is a global average, and so some places warm up more than that, and some places warm up less. And what you find is that the Arctic, for example, warm, tends to warm up a lot more than the rest of the world. And you have to remember that one degree is somewhat larger than what the warming has already been. And the projections are for not just one degree, but somewhere between one and a half and six degrees. And um, let's take you know, somewhere in that mix is probably what's going to happen. But let's suppose it's mid-range, let's say four degrees. Think back uh, in recent times what the hottest day you remember and add on four degrees. It's a big number. Thank you. I think coming to Australia was the hottest day I remember. Um, <laughs> question at the back. <laughs> I guess the, um, uh, what, oh, sorry, sorry, I won't just leap in quickly. Um, uh, a four degree different temperature climate for the, for the globe is, is, is a climate that humans haven't been around for. Um, you know, the, the previous previous uh, warm period prior to the last ice age was about a degree warmer than what we are at the moment because of those orbital forcings that Carl mentioned. Um, uh, but humans haven't been around for, you have to go back quite a long way to find a period in time, millions of years to find a period in time uh, that that was four degrees warmer. We, and that, the Earth was a very, very different place then. And, and again, the salient fact is the time scale. So a two degree warming over 50,000 years is something that we can all cope with, and that's what we've seen in the geological record. A two degree warming over, say, 100 or 150 years, if you look through the geological record, the only, the only previous analogues or examples of that is when either asteroids strike the Earth or you have massive volcanic activity across the whole planet. And that rapid change in atmospheric chemistry, the rate of change, is the thing that we're actually most concerned about, rather than the magnitude of the change. And those abrupt changes yeah. in the past were associated with really large extinctions of, of life on the Almost Earth Almost well. all of them were associated with mass extinctions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just, just along the lines of what um, I think Carl was saying there, with um, a more energy trapped in the system and intensifying the hydrological cycle, um, and I guess wetter places near the tropics getting wetter and, and the Mediterranean areas getting drier, is that, that's kind of in line with what we're seeing, isn't it? So more, more wetter... Yeah, more energy look, systems in north of Australia? Emerging, emerging evidence. Okay. And because of that background, and as Scott showed, that huge envelope around Australian rainfall due to natural variability means that we're just not certain yet. It's circumstantial <coughs> evidence, so we're sort of watching it in terms of de determining, look, are we getting this, this emerging signal already in the rainfall? Um, but I think it's still early days to firmly attribute that. What would you say, Scott? I think there have been some studies that have tried to understand the cause of the, the rainfall changes in terms of you know, natural variability or um, human influence. And in Southwest WA, I think there is clear evidence that it's very hard to explain the decline uh, without bringing climate change into account. Um, there's other studies that have looked globally, so they look at the, the pattern of change. And they find that the pattern of change doesn't look like what they see naturally but it is consistent with the sorts of patterns of change we see in our climate models 
when we increase greenhouse gases. But I think you know, uppermost in our mind is um, rainfall, but uh, it's, it's the trickiest one to try and address the question, has climate change, has, have humans influenced our climate? If you look at sea level, if you look at temperature, it jumps off the page. It's just almost, it's virtually impossible to deny it. But um, you know, because we are focused so much on rainfall, and rainfall at a particular location, I don't think anyone in this room would sensibly be convinced that the variability they've seen at their particular location is due to climate change without looking at all this other evidence that's out there. It's only when you pull all the evidence together, the re retreat of the glaciers, increase in sea level, um, increase in ocean temperatures, increase in temperatures over Australia, increase in, in um, sea level around the coastlines of Australia. It's, it's, it's very hard to deny uh, something else is going on. And, and complicating rainfall in Australia is an influence from stratospheric ozone reductions uh, uh, in the southern hemisphere and potentially an influence from, from increased aerosols from things like forest fire burning. Um, you know, we're, we're still trying to negotiate our way through understanding that through the, through the climate modelling process, which takes a long time to, to run these models. Okay. So we've got a question down here at the front and then up there at the back. Hello. My name, uh, sorry, hello. My name is John Lethbridge, Hydro Hydrological Society. I just want to get more local effects. Um, the floods in Brisbane, we had floods in 74, and the net outcome was build a dam. So they built the Wyvern Ho, and the floods in 2010, and it didn't make any difference. So what, what are we going to do, build more dams or not? <laughs> I'd ask you, you're the hydrologist. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I actually don't have a sensible answer to that uh, uh, um, because I'm not a hydrologist. Um, so in terms of what we do planning with water management, it's a really, really... Uh, what I do understand from, from my role um, with the Bureau <coughs> is that is one of the more difficult things to work out is how you engineer for what we call the probability density function or basically an envelope of changes into the future. So um, if we could give one timeline of what was going to happen into the future, all the planners would be very happy. If they knew at 2030 um, suddenly the rainfall was going to change as a step change or whatever, they'd be very happy. And so to engineer some things to account for a range of, or an increased range of variability is a very, very expensive thing to do. So that's uh, really a diabolical planning issue that we face. And, you know, I get asked the question, well, what can you tell me? And generally the answer that you give them isn't really one that makes them very happy. So, um, you know, I understand this is it's a very, very difficult space to work in. Yeah. Could, I, could I leap in there as well? Um, that's a, a really important point, I think, in, the, in terms of what we've seen in the last nine months or so with this really strong La Nina event. There's been a, a large number of, of, of um, extreme rainfall events and flooding issues, um, certainly obviously in the eastern states, but also, also more locally as well. And so, you know, we're getting planners already and, and you know, emergency services people and those, all sorts of different areas asking, you know, the question, is this climate change, you know, are, are we seeing what's going to happen with rainfall intensity changes under climate change in, in coming decades? Now, it gets really, really, starts getting really complicated when you, when you start seeing Scott's graph of um, we may actually see more El Nino-like conditions becoming more, more prevalent. Um, so they may, that may be... May, may lead to may lead to less less rain, less, less rain. Um, but at the same time we've got warmer oceans around Australia from the great warming trend that Carl mentioned causing more water vapour to be available so we've got different competing influences on rainfall intensity which has big impacts on flooding and you know, storm, uh, managing storm um, storm runoff and that, those sorts of things so very important questions for people trying to plan um, under climate change but there's still a fair a, a way to go in terms of those sorts of, um, you know, what, what will we actually pin, to pin down the numbers in, in some of those sorts of areas. Okay, so we've got a question at the back, and then over there, and then down at the front. Yeah, hello, my name is Christian. Um, I was just wondering, we were talking about rising sea levels and having a population spread at the coastline here in Australia. I know in Europe they talk about the Netherlands gone from the map, um, Denmark, huge problems. Um, what are the predictions, let's say, 4% increase in temperature? When will this affect the major Australian cities with the rising sea levels? And maybe you can talk us through to some, some scenarios you would expect. How long till Australia is underwater? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, might, I might just leap in because um, 
the, the Bureau's National Tidal Centre, um, who actually install, operate and analyse the data from the tide gauges and sea level rise monitoring system um, around Australia, are actually based in our Adelaide office here. Um, and so you can actually go on, online and, and look on our webpage and see their reports of annual sea level rise right around Australia. And um, there's, for, for, the, for the Adelaide area for instance, we've av averaged about four millimetres per year um, since the gauge went in at Port Stanvac um, in 1992. So that's significant sea level rise of about nine centimetres per year. And that's accounting for all the various you know, movements of the instrument on the jetty and the, you know, the movement of the land and all that sort of stuff. So it's quite a lot of work gone into making that very as accurate as possible and just reflecting what's happening with the, with the rise of the sea level itself and not other influences. So there, there's actual, there's very clearly um, sea level rise going on and significant sea level rise occurring around Australia already. Um, and the future projections, I, I guess, so I guess the front line of, of sea level rise is, is increased frequency of storm surge events. And so if we get a half a metre sea level rise, in mean, mean sea level rise, that change is expected, that's expected to change the frequency of storm, storm surge events from about a one in 100 year event to about once every five years or so. So that's pretty significant because those sorts of events have big economic impacts. Yeah, sea level is probably going to be the biggest impact for Australia. We didn't talk about it here tonight because you know, we're asked to talk about um, various things and we can't talk about everything at once. But yeah, certainly Engineers Australia, I think they've estimated there's probably about 700,000 um, pieces of infrastructure uh, under threat from future sea level change. Um, and Sorry, it's under threat immediately or? No, it's, it's really this storm surge um, scenario that uh, Darren talks about. So for every one unit of sea level rise you get, your coastal erosion is something like 50 or 100 times that. So um, there's, you can get some very clear pictures around Australia on the Gold Coast, parts of South Australia, Western Australia, where there's been significant erosion from just a few centimetres that we've had in sea level rise. How that will probably play out over time is you get increased storm surges, you'll find some properties inundated, potentially at some point they become uninsurable. So it's, it's a really huge cost in the system. And when you go around Australia and talk to water planners and everything else, it's surprising how many people have, how many um, institutions have, have infrastructure at sea level that's vulnerable. So really, yeah, that, that is one of the, the bigger ones in the system. And in terms of the future, again, it depends on rates of, of snow and ice melt that, that sort of these um, non-linear feedbacks in the system. But it's the most integrated measure of climate change. Um, so that means it's, it's the most stable measure is if you measure sea level rise. Um, Scott, do you want to yeah. take this one? Okay. okay, there's a question at the back. Yes, I have a question um, from our online audience from the Grenfell Street Guru. He says, can any of the speakers say whether or not the recent Queensland floods were exacerbated by anthropogenic climate change? <laughs> um, record. Well, well um, we know that we've just, as Darren was saying, we've just come through a very, very strong La Nina event and we know from our studies of history and climate models that during La Nina events, the risk of flood is increased and there's a tendency that if the La Nina event is strong, that you would expect that that risk is even um, more, uh, is, is elevated even further. Um, so, you know, I think primarily the floods we've seen are entirely consistent with it being a very, very strong La Nina event. Um, if you go to the climate models, and you ask the question, what happens to extreme rainfall under uh, increased greenhouse gases? What you find is that in some parts of the world, the, uh, for example, even in places where the rainfall, average rainfall tends to increase, you do tend to find an increase in he the heaviest rainfall. And in some places where the rainfall, average rainfall declines, in some of those places, heavy rainfall also tends to increase. And so people say, hang on a minute, how can average rainfall drop but heavy rainfall go up? And the secret is, the secret is because you have to wait longer for the rainfall. So you have many more rain-free days, but when that rain does come, there's a tendency for it to be heavier. Now that doesn't occur in all the model, in all regions of the world, uh, but it is a fairly strong tendency. Quantifying that I think is problematic. I think that the models still have a long way to go in accurately simulating rainfall. And so I think it's a plausible hypothesis that there may have been some exacerbation, but I don't think we're able to quantify it to any extent. 
But like I said, I think it's primarily the response to a very large natural La Nina event. Yeah, and in some ways, look, the weather today was influenced by increasing greenhouse gases. Um, it's, it's now a part of the climate system that we've got a 40% increase in greenhouse gases. And that 40% increase means that we are observing some changes, but at this stage, it's, it's subtle. Um, I use a medical analogy for this. It's a bit like someone that's 22 who smokes, you know, half a pack a day. And um, there's a very clear risk for them at 50. If they were reasonably fit and went to a doctor, you'd probably only find a little bit of evidence of the impact of that, that habit or that behaviour. Um, so sometimes we ask this question as if it almost ameliorates the future risk. Uh, but, you know, that 22-year-old, he can do all the tests he wants and prove himself to be fit. Um, they know um, from the fundamental science that actually you're still going to be at future risk from that. What we tend to do here is, you know, if we don't, if, if we don't see clear evidence right now from a 40% increase, um, it's almost like, well, yay, I can go up to two packs a day um, and keep on going. And that's clearly not the way science works. Um, so I think people, when they ask, oh, was this climate change or not, really need to think that all our weather is influenced by climate change now. But we're going to, with a 40% increase, notice it in certain variables and in certain outcomes more than others. I guess, I mean, there were, Carl mentioned that we, we, we've seen record warmest ocean temperatures around Australia through this La Nina event. And that's, at the same time, we've also seen uh, record highest relative humidities in Queensland, um, and so, you know, the, the sort of associated responses in those record warmest oceans have, have, have um, in terms of the, the oceans, those warm oceans providing more moisture availability into the atmosphere. So there is, I think, a, a fairly reasonable argument that it, it probably has, it probably did, those record warmest ocean temperatures probably did um, make things a little bit worse than they would have been otherwise. Um, but it, as the trying to actually pin down exactly to what extent is, is very, very difficult. But, but that, that starts to become a new baseline, that background warming in the ocean yeah. temperatures. So what we've seen this year in terms of record sea surface temperatures and a La Nina is going to be much more likely in the short term future and then it's almost certain once you go out to th yeah. 30 or 40 years. Okay, we're down to our last 10 minutes or so, so we're going to have to speed up. We've got about um, four or five hands that are dotting up, so please everyone try and keep your questions as short and sweet as possible. One here quickly, then at the back, uh, then again. Yes, we've talked about uh, rainfall um, being uh, difficult to, to project in the future, but there's two other factors which I'd just like you to comment on, and they are um, evaporation, um, not just from the oceans, but, but I'm thinking of evapotranspiration from the land, and also um, water vapour in, in the um, atmosphere itself. Um, can you comment on those projections? Um, it's in a technical report that I could send to you, <laughs> <laughs> but I must admit I can't remember all of the, the details of it for Australia. Maybe that's one more save for later than yep. for afterwards if that's okay. Uh, question up at the back. We talked about global temperature rises of sort of four degrees and um, the fact that people find it difficult to look beyond their own lives. Um, what is it going to mean for Australians? Is there any evidence to suggest that, you know, what's going to happen in terms of Australian data? compared to the global trend? <coughs> Sorry, so was the question, what's the projections for Australia and how do they compare to the rest of the world? Yeah, and what does it actually mean for Australians as opposed to sort of global data? As a, as a non-climate scientist, I find it difficult to interpret what does it mean for me and what does it mean for my um, community? Um, for you in particular, I'm not sure, but... <laughs> uh, well, if it was four degrees, I guess one, one consequence of that would be if that carried over to a four degree increase in extreme temperature, that the more e most extreme temperature you've felt before, imagine if that was four degrees higher. It may not be as simple as that, but it's, you know, it would certainly be higher as we move into the further into this current century. Um, I mean, this is all very subjective to answer this question, but in my mind, one of the Problem. One of the uh, things that's foremost in my mind when it comes to Australia is the impact that climate change is having and will have on the Great Barrier Reef. Because, you know, we humans, um, certainly some vulnerable people will be adversely affected. You know, they'll be killed by heat waves and so on, as they have in the past. But, you know, at least we can do something 
most of us can do something about it with air conditioning and clever use of uh, building technologies and so on. But ecosystems don't have a lot of options. A lot of ecosystems don't have a lot of options. And one set of those is in the Great Barrier Reef. And we already know that excursions of not too great in temperature can cause widespread bleaching. And that's going to become the norm. And so the um, status of the Great Barrier Reef seems extremely precarious. Yeah, it, it really depends what you're talking about and it covers such a wide range of variables. So if we just choose temperature and rainfall over southern Australia, um, increased temperatures exacerbate drought and global warming probably prolongs drought on the whole. Whether that's going to affect this corner of South, South Australia, we can't really say. But what are the flow on effects of that? Um, water scarcity is one. Um, greater fire potential and greater fire risk is another. So you probably get more frequent severe fires for a time, then you probably have vegetation regime change after that, and you have savanna instead of forest. So that's the sort of thing where it starts to become very difficult. As climate scientists, what we really do is set the climate system forcing for what happens um, to the natural world and to ecosystems and social systems. Um, that's probably where our communication falls down because we can't really take that up. Um, but that's sort of something that's starting to emerge, I think. We're getting more research from social scientists and from, from biologists and others um, sort of coming into this, this greater body of research. Darren? Yeah, um, I guess one, one, one good resource is the, uh, the Climate Change in Australia report, which was um, put out um, in 2007. It's the, the currently the most up-to-date um, sort of information on climate change projections for Australia. And there's, a, there's an Adelaide summary page in that and that talks about the numbers of, of days over 35, for instance, going from 35 to, a, in a four degree world, about um, uh, basically uh, doubling or more. So, you know, that's um, significant changes in, num in, on in extreme heat days. Um, there's projected increases in bushfire risk, so possibly a doubling in the numbers of extreme fire weather days. Um, and, you know, one simple way of look, thinking about it is perhaps what is, a, what is a location that has a climate that's four degrees warmer than, than Adelaide currently is? And you have to start going into locations into central parts of South Australia, so up past, you know, um, up past sort of Port Augusta in, into Woomera and those sorts of areas. And so Carl mentioned, you know, uh, a change in our ecological systems from a, a, the, the current sort of climate, current sort of situation we currently have into something that starts getting a lot drier, obviously, um, you know, and turns into more of a um, much drier vegetation. Uh, so, you know, we're facing vegetation die-offs as a possibility. Um, you know, a four degrees is very li there's likely to be very, um, a very significant reduction to the amount of water coming, down, coming down the Murray River system. We're currently very, very heavily reliant on that for our water supply here in Australia and in South Australia generally. So a four degree world means we, we're probably not gonna be able to rely on Murray River water as a source of, uh, as a water source for our, our settled communities in South Australia. Um, so, and then there's obviously sea level rise, uh, four degree world, we're talking about you know, half a metre or more of sea level rise with uh, all the sort of attendant impacts of that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's certainly a whole range of significant impacts. Impacts on ecological systems responding um, because they, they don't have places to go as their, uh, as their, their regimes, um, you know, their sort of places they can go to decrease. Um, yeah, it's, it's not, a, not a very nice world to contemplate. Okay, so we've got three questions. Hopefully we'll try and squeeze in before the very end. So, Jane. Um, Jane Lomax-Smith, I'm actually a pathologist and I would have thought the impacts that we might well feel would be more skin cancers, melanoma, and the march of all those tropical diseases like dengue fever south past Brisbane to Sydney. Yeah, it's, it's actually really hard to work out and there's conflicting research on things like spread of dengue fever and others. Um, skin cancers, I'm not sure, it's mostly related to UV rather than just straight out temperature. Um, so you, you really need global ozone reductions, but that's not to say there, there isn't a, a, a knock-on effect in that because I'm, I'm not a doctor, so, um, well, not a medical doctor. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, look, I think, again, sometimes I think the research lags where it needs to be and understanding, you know, what will be... The, we do attempt this through the climate impacts um, part of the IPCC reviews. So the IPCC reviews the basic science um, 
to do with climate change. There is another working group that looks at impacts on things like health. Um, at this point, you know, from, from my reading of it is that a lot more work needs to be done, but that potentially that work is what motivates people most, rather than um, our very, what, what is very dry um, physical uh, um, stuff that not, not many people understand, quite frankly. So <laughs> um, I think it's very important that we understand those social and health changes. Um, but looking at, uh, sorry, just looking at um, the events of Black Saturday um, and mm. those excess deaths from, you know, I, I guess in the medical profession it's called premature harvesting, um, which is a really horrible term for people that, that <laughs> die early due to um, um, environmental effects. In South Australia, there was a very good program, public health program, to do with checking on the mentally ill and, and those um, who are most vulnerable to heat stress. And things like ambulance call-outs and other provision of services. And deaths in South Australia was significantly less than in Victoria because of that. So there's certainly things that need to be organised at the social level in response to the change we're already seeing. OK, I'm afraid really time for the very, very last question. Please make it very quick. Well, this is actually not a question, but I'm trying to help the panel to answer this Wivenhoe Dam question. Uh, you have to remember the Wivenhoe Dam was built for two purposes. One is to secure drinking water for Brisbane, and the other is to make Brisbane flood proof. And these two purposes contradict each other, because during a period of drought, you can only secure enough drinking water to keep the level of the dam as high as you can. But to actually make it uh, flood proof, you have to keep the dam em empty so that it fills up when there's a lot of rain. And uh, as Scott said, uh, it is more likely that there will be longer periods of very low rainfall, and then all of a sudden very intense rainfall. And you cannot handle that scheme with a dam that serves both purposes, obviously because during the periods of long drought, you keep the dam as high as you can, and then all of a sudden when the rain comes, it's already full. So the answer is not more dams, but the answer is desalination plants for your drinking water and a dam for the flood proofing. Okay, um, well, thank you very much. And we'll end it there, because we really have run out of time. Um, I want to say thank you ever so much to all of you for your fantastic questions. Uh, it's been illuminating. And, of course, to our speakers, to Darren, Carl and Scott, who've made it such a fantastic evening. So thank you. <laughs>